Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 1, start in verse 13, and read a few pat verses and as we prepare. Verse 13, in him, in Christ that is, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So that's what it's all about. Um, as believers, uh, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we may know more fully what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so it's an opportunity as we gather for that to unfold through the ministry of the Spirit. And as we think of walking in the Spirit, uh, one of the things that just I kind of thought about this week as I was thinking about this passage was in him you also trusted and then we are sealed with the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit indwells us uh, we get mechanical sometimes about this whole thing and in some of the ways which we go about our spirituality but we are each personally indwelled by the Holy Spirit that's a pretty <laughs> heavy weighty thing to think about uh, but that brings it to a level where it's, it's so intimately relational that as we orient to the ministry of the Spirit, it's not something out there. It's something inside. We are indwelt by the Spirit, so we are that much more guaranteed of the working of the ministry of the Spirit as we orient to uh, Him and are in right relationship with Him. So as we prepare to now go into the study, let's take a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll open in prayer. Father, as we come together and look to you for a time of worship, in your word, a time of submitting ourselves to its working in our lives that we might lay hold of that for which we have been laid hold of in Christ. We acknowledge the full provision you've made for us as we orient to it to be brought further along unto the fuller stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the provision of this time. Um, even though it's routine for us, we don't take it for granted. And we recognize its importance, pray that we would put aside any distraction this morning that would deter your working in our hearts, that we might, you might bring about the full benefit that you desire unto your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we've been, by way of introduction, hearing for some time now not just from the world where we would expect it, but from within Christendom that Christianity must adjust to the times, to the cultural winds that blow. And I'm not talking about those things that distinguish cultures from one another in ways that are morally neutral, but those things that actually represent moral decline where we, what we know as traditional values have been marginalized on their way to complete abolishment. 
And when I speak of traditional values, I'm referring most specifically to those things that ultimately find their basis and grounding in the divine order as God had created and intended. For these values to abide, man must see this connection and honor it. Can't be something we grasp by way of experience alone in some kind of vacuum of absolute framework. Especially as believers, we must ground these things, these values, these convictions in divine viewpoint according to scripture if, they are to, if they're going to be firmly moored in our hearts against the onslaught of all that involves and drives, on the other hand, human viewpoint. We understand that traditional values can be perpetuated in some measure for a time by sheer momentum of societal custom and function. Uh, and for, so if we were more particularly to look at America, for instance, we find this with respect to biblical principles that were embedded in our founding, even amidst at that time and for a time and even till today, significant doctrinal differences on certain things that have in themselves ultimately sown weakness within and undermined Christianity itself. More specifically, oops, more specifically, we note this regarding divine institutions, as we are familiar with, uh, volition or personal responsibility, marriage, family, human government, nationalism, from before and through our official independence as a nation to relatively recently, the momentum of the honoring of these institutions has anchored our nation, and as they would any society. And we've been blessed by the stability and other benefits that have accrued to our favor, even in our failings, some original as far as our nation's concerned, to most fully live according to God's truth and its implications. This is largely a testimony not only to the inherent power of these institutions as we abide in them, which is conveyed to mankind even unwittingly, but perhaps more so to the grace of God who has interceded, that has interceded to preserve us as a nation in the face of the constant assault of Satan's efforts to divorce us from God's word and aligning with its principles. But as with every historical, biblical, and secular case, America as a nation has succumbed to this onslaught. It appears we've reached the point where the trajectory of our inevitable decline has steepened. We find the under, underpinnings of traditional values have buckled under the weight of the unrelenting advance of progressive secular morals. An allegiance to divine institutions and their principles and implications which had come to amount to an innate but unwitting shell at this point has crumbled. This highlights the principle of a remnant among God's people who've sought to stand firm amidst prevailing national societal conditions that are opposed to God's will. This remnant has found some of the harshest hostility from others within the camp, others who name the name of God, even the name of Christ, even at times from the broadest realm of that, the vast majority of so-called God's people. This further stresses the importance of being grounded in the fundamentals that we ourselves are not seduced by modern Christian thinking, which at best is nothing more than Christianized secularism, the attempt to simply do something worldly better than the world does. So back to Genesis. If we do not accept the account of Genesis as historical and authoritative as such and in its details and implications, we find no basis to hold fast to those things that it addresses regarding God's created order. And if there is no absolute basis in this sense, then even where man claims biblical values by human rationale, they are just lumped into what at best may be experientially the most logical. <laughs> 
Well, nothing wrong with that as a starting point, but human rationale is ultimately no match for the relentless attacks of Satan. The only basis upon which we may firmly abide within the realm of divine viewpoint is faith in God's revelation, faith in God's word. What we may observe by way of reality may coincide, unsurprisingly, with what we accept by faith, but what we experience, what we observe, is not needed to support faith. In our recap of this study in Genesis 1 through 12, we've been looking at transcendent truths and principles that we find regarding creation. As we have worked through this, we put this in the overall context of the order with which God established things, which is ultimately in keeping with important aspects of the order we see in the Godhead itself. We've wrapped up our review of God's created order regarding male, female, man, woman, though we'll get back to it after the fall for some important things that are introduced there. And we looked at this generally in terms of those things that first relate to the fundamental equality as rooted in the image of God. Then within this vital sphere, we noted the key framework of principal roles that more particularly further govern gender distinctions, all of which, as we know, was proclaimed very good by God and embraced as such by man pre-fall at that time. And last time, we simply saw this more particularly regarding the institution of marriage. Today, we will tackle a couple loose ends, though, before moving on to Genesis 3, uh, which we will get into next time. But for these loose ends, we're going to start with Genesis 2, 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. We've noted here, by way of loose end number one, the timeless principle of the rest of God and the derivative of this as intended in the rest of man. It's important to see that God did not rest because he was tired or fatigued in the sense that we relate to it according to our physical frame. God was simply done with creation and had in a sense certified this by declaring everything that he had made very good. We considered two important implications of this by way of observation and principles. First, we find a dimension of God's resting that is central to its meaning in relationship to God, but also by extension in a vital way to mankind. And this is the notion of taking satisfaction in the result of his completed work. As Tom Constable frames this simply, God blessed the seventh day of inactivity in that he set it apart as different from the other days of creation. It was a memorial of his creative work. God was satisfied with the work that he had done. So the first side of this is that God rested in the sense of ceased his activity took in what he had created as he proclaimed it very good and was satisfied completely with, with it at that stage, of course, in his handiwork. The second principle we noted was that of the fundamental nature of God's creation and some important implications of this regarding uh, relative to God's sovereignty. 
As Stanley Udd describes in his book, A Genesis Journal, there are two primary veins of thought concerning the nature of God's preservation of creation. On one hand, there is the so-called continuous creation view, which describes where God, through ongoing effort, directs every facet of every motion of everything down to the smallest particle. In other words, God is still from that point of, even at the time he said it was finished in terms of creation and resting, is micro-controlling the physical universe. But on the other hand, we find what's called completed creation, where God set creation in motion in the context of a framework of physical laws and free agency that innately govern the physical universe. So let's break these two down. The Hebrew word for rest here is shavath, which simply signifies ceasing or desisting. It is most often, at least in the King James Version, translated to cease. It is used in verse two of chapter two in conjunction with God ending his work, which seems to reinforce this sense, the idea of ceasing, desisting. Ud thus describes the completed creation view as reckoning, quote, that the nature of the creative process of that first week was of such a quality that the universe operates on its own apart from constant input of the energy on God's part. So this is what is expressed in he rested. Now by this general framework, in this way, completed creation, God has embedded his control through his creative process. And according to this framework, he maintains control and intercedes at particular times and in particular ways according to his good pleasure to work all things out according to the counsel of his will. So what you have is God set things in motion according to certain created innate parameters, but then not only reserves, of course, the sovereign right, but actually acts on that to intervene in time, at times, to direct more particularly within this realm. So you see that we have tension between these two views, continuous creation and completed creation, that bears critical suggestions regarding what amounts to God's sovereignty. And these distinctions or implications or suggestions are not trivial. In the continuous creation view, God's sovereignty, as seen in his infinite capacity, is defined by an absolute involvement in not only knowing every detail of life, but effectively controlling it down to the most minute particle through direct intervention. In effect, then, the laws of physics are a mirage since they have no true bearing on reality independent of God's actions to micro-direct the actions of every particle in the universe. Yet it is a theoretical possibility for this to be the case where man has misapplied his limited reasoning capacities in an otherwise noble attempt to wrap one's mind around the concept of God's sovereignty. And tracing this out, we see the damage that's wrought in the realm of soteriology in terms of man's free agency and his personal accountability to God as one among all for whom Christ died. Not only, therefore, does God micromanage every particle of dust that is invisible to our eye but is floating around within this space, but he has to direct, as we've seen, the selection and the actions that follow selection unto salvation of each individual. So not only are the laws of physics a mirage, but free agency is a mirage too.
Now on the other side of the coin, we have completed creation. This view holds that God's sovereignly set creation in motion in a completed form as governed by a multitude of principles of motion, life, and free agency. God has not relinquished his control or expressed his disinterest in creation, though, as a result. In fact, it would be argued that this yields a higher view of God's sovereignty. God is not confined to a human construct of necessary microcontrol. That is the highest level at which man's finite capacity can fashion God being God. On the other hand, we can see that God is so big that he accomplishes his will, not just by direct intervention, which remains frequent, as we see recorded in scripture and otherwise, but he accomplishes his will through the rules of life that he fixed and set in motion at creation and that generally prevail over the physical universe. This view is most consistent with the wide array of factors we may consider from a common sense understanding of scripture to certain physical realities that we observe, such as the second law of thermodynamics, that things tend to decay and disorder. Now that's of course post fall in the time we live. Uh, we would not see the second law of thermodynamics as prevailing before the fall, but nevertheless, it's something that is in motion. It's, it's just embedded in reality. So in summary of this principle, God rested. His working relative to creation ceased. In his satisfaction, he had declared at that time everything that he had ceased from making very good. And from the realities and principles of God's rest now, we find an implicit basis for man's rest, which later, beyond Genesis 2, is described and directed of us explicitly. So now let's turn to the practical implications, uh, realities, truths, principles related to rest as they relate to man. Perhaps the most familiar form of this in direct connection to our Genesis passage is found in the fourth commandment. Turn to Exodus 20 verse 8. Among the Ten Commandments, this commandment is given the most extensive context. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now in direct association with God's resting, as we see here at the end of creation, the Jews were required to cease from any labor on the seventh day of every week. Now underlying this was a deeper vital principle that was to be observed. Reflection on and resting in God and his provision. Yet its observance, as directed explicitly here, was to be followed by Israel, irrespective of where one's heart may be. Even where one's heart may not have been in sync with one's outward practice of simply ceasing from work. It served as a corporate testimony through Israel as being God's chosen people. So one's heart wasn't required to be aligned with it, though that is really what is intended. 
but it was directed so that the nation Israel might proclaim as a chosen people that they were distinct, they were separate. It was a testimony in that sense corporately. Unfortunately, not only did its observance, the Sabbath's observance, not largely coincide with a proper heart posture on the part of the people, it became more and more legalistically complicated under the apostate religious rulers. And even though not in force uh, beyond the cross, Sabbath observance has been adopted legalistically at various levels within Christianity, as we know. And this is the breakdown. The Sabbath is not only reduced to something subject to rote observance, detached from, uh, detached from inner worship. In this, it becomes abusive in its humanly derived embellishments and manipulations. Instead of the Sabbath channeling worship and rest by grace through faith, it occupies the role of a tyrannical taskmaster by works unto excessive piety, outwardly that is. Now there's nothing wrong with setting Sunday aside in a Sabbath sense. As long as its observance is bathed in spiritual rest, and for this, in seeing a direct connection regarding church age truth, turn ahead to Hebrews 4. You, we're familiar with, and I should have jotted it down, but I'm going to do my best to paraphrase it. One man regards one day above another. Another regards all days alike. We are free as believers to have that in our liberty distinction and, and adopt our convictions accordingly. But we should be unified in the spiritual underlying spiritual realities that that, that bears. Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to begin right at verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, that's God's rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of this rest, of it. For indeed the gospel, or here, euangelion, good news, not the gospel in a technical sense, but good news. He, for indeed the gospel, the good news was preached to us as well as to them, Israel. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had, Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now, what we find here independent of a most direct association with the Sabbath, even in speaking of the children of Israel in this context, is the principle of the rest of man that finds its basis in the rest of God as identified with the seventh day of creation. The rest of man proceeds by faith out of a right orientation to God, his person, his actions, and his word. That is the fundamental principle of our rest, man's rest. And this is the way it was intended for man from creation forward independent of the fourth commandment uh, 
designed to highlight Israel corporately as his chosen people at that time. Now let's see the way this principle in its intended sense uh, existed by way of two examples before the law, before the fourth commandment came into being. Turn back to Genesis 15.1. This follows the same pattern of the promise and the law, right? Where we see that Abraham believed the promise and the promise was in effect in advance of the law. It took precedence over the law. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, granted, we're going to be reading between the lines here, but I still think it's clear. This passage offers a good context in developing the principle of the rest of man as it was intended to extend from God's rest. Again, the important way we need to see this in terms of a transcendent principle is in man deriving rest through meditation on God in his person, his works, and word. Now, we mix these things with faith and find the God-intended place of rest while glorifying him. In verse 1 here, we see God declaring himself to be Abraham's all in all, his protector and his provider. God wanted Abraham to focus his attention on his character, specifically as directed personally toward Abraham. And in verse 5, God directs Abram or Abraham's attention to the heavens, which we know declare the glory of God and show his handiwork. So God wanted Abraham to also meditate on his works. God sets his promise to Abraham in this context. And, he resp and Abraham responded as God desired and according to that which would yield rest and righteousness, as we saw in Hebrews 4. Abraham mixed his faith with God's promise, and he drew on the character and the creative power of the one behind the promise, the one who himself had looked back on all that he had made, as we're going back to Genesis now, and saw in it, in it himself the full testimony, full testimony of an all powerful personal provider that would form the basis of our assurance, uh, confidence, and trust. This is the transcendent principle that prevailed from the beginning of all of mankind that has been able to bear witness and have the and man to have opportunity thus to respond to it. This formed the basis of God's right to expect it to prevail among his chosen people, which is where we get to the biblical concept of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was actually first formally instituted by this designation in conjunction with God's provision of manna which was before it was formally codified as a commandment. Shortly after leaving Egypt, the Israelites began to complain about the lack of food. God promised to provide food, and he did so initially in the form of 
quail at evening, and manna every morning. So though in a precursor form, it established as a corporate Sabbath rest, the demanding of it in an outward form, outward observance, yet in this sense, it remained and it was completely grounded on inward resting on God. Among those things that the children of Israel had witnessed up to this point, and as chronicled in many places going even forward, as a basis of depending on God, resting in him, were the plagues of Egypt, which displayed both God's miraculous power and his sheltering protection of them as his people. Then Israel had just witnessed God's deliverance from Pharaoh's army through the parting of the Red Sea and then collapsing it on, his, on their pursuers. And as Israel was embarking on a journey through unknown places, fraught with uncertainty regarding their daily provisions, they needed to have confidence in God that they could draw from the prior events fixed in their hearts in providing miraculously further for their daily sustenance God or offered reinforcement for this confidence in memorializing the seventh day as a time of rest and reflection on his faithful provision and protection God provided a regular daily opportunity to be refreshed in this confidence now it's not hard to see this principle at the heart of the Sabbath as we consider these things in that light. And this is the true spirit of the Sabbath that we see explicitly as we read in Hebrews 4 and may derive implicitly from the myriad of passages where God's people are exhorted are encouraged to meditate on God's person, on his works, and his word as our source of rest. Now the Lord addressed the Sabbath and its true role in Mark 2.27. So turn to Mark 2.27. Just going to break in here. And he said to them, the Pharisees and that were questioning him about this, about the role of the Sabbath. Well, let's go back to see the full context. Start in verse 23. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. That's work. Just set the stage here. And the Pharisees said to him, look. Why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Christ said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was, was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Essentially, Christ was saying that God instituted the Sabbath for man's benefit, i.e., in the right spiritual posture for his rest through worship of God. When the outward observance of the Sabbath supplanted this benefit, it had missed the mark. It had taken precedence. The Sabbath itself had taken precedence over man, who God intended to be blessed by proper orientation to the Sabbath according to faith rest. Now, it is vital that we sever ourselves from any legalistic attachment to the Sabbath as a day of conformance to an outward standard of rest. Even for Israel, 
This was not, it's, as we've seen, its primary intended focus. If an individual Jew was of a right spiritual posture, outward conformance to the Sabbath observance under the Mosaic Code would not only have been undertaken happily, but it would also have contributed to the glory of God as the nation corporately displayed this. In keeping with God's intent expressed in Hebrews 4, God's rest is accessible whether we are physically active or not. In fact, we are called to this form of rest. Ceasing activity in itself is not a conduit to this form of rest. Though needed, physical rest, and even perhaps of benefit in the same way as Israel's Sabbath required, we don't have to cease physical activity to rest, for it is a spiritual matter first. I don't know what's going on with this. I know it's probably me, but... And when it comes to matters of the spirit, spiritual matters, they govern 24-7, irrespective, in spite of, whatever our circumstances happen to be. Sometimes we can control our circumstances, sometimes we can't. The subject of God's rest occupies, as we've seen, a small segment of Genesis chapter 2. But you can see the importance of it in a transcendent principle sense. Even today, as it has been laid out in much more uh, biblical context. All right, one final quick loose end in wrapping up today. Turn now back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the f first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hittichel, or Tigris, which is more familiar to us, and I think the New American Standard translates it that way. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now here we have a limited description of the original geography of the immediate area forming the context of the Garden of Eden. And the key phrase here is original geography. Among the curious things in, that, that we find here are we see included references to two rivers which have modern correspondence, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and a country, a land, Assyria. But Beyond being a reference to an original formation, we recognize at least one major intervening event that would have reshaped the world's geography since the point of creation. The flood, right? Nevertheless, so there's been a dramatic change in what was originally in place to today. Nevertheless, as with other passages with scant detail, this hasn't prevented people from seeking to craft some sort of hypothetical original geography out of what we find revealed here. Now this offers an example of where we may chase a rabbit way too far.
resulting in arguing among models uh, that we've come up with against others that have come, one, each, each of them coming to erroneous conclusions, even if humanly reasonable. Now, if God revealed these things, they're there, why shouldn't we run with them? Well, maybe, maybe these minimal details aren't there for anything more than couching this account in normal descriptive language, only to the extent necessary to give it a natural context. The fact that there's correspondence to, a, to modern geographical fake features doesn't amount to direct connection. Man has named rivers after other rivers. The Thames River right in our backyard. Cities after other cities and a whole array of geographic features after other features. Some surmise that Genesis 2 describes a single original contiguous landmass with Eden tucked within it in a way that provided ideal environmental conditions topographically, atmospherically, hydrologically, botanically, etc. No doubt, at the beginning, these original conditions were part of the very good assessment of what God had created. You know how beyond that, even secular man takes the various shapes of the continents and can fit them together, right? You take Africa, South America, you know, Asia, and they all they had kind of form like a puzzle, right? Who knows? Maybe, it, maybe there was some, you know, original single landmass from which the flood caused major disruptions among other uh, catastrophic uh, elements of what happened and has caused things to, to shift and move. Something happened, certainly from the beginning. But beyond seeing what we have here revealed to the extent that we should take it generally, no one living then, Adam and Eve, is present. No one living then, Adam and Eve, took pictures, preserved them. So we need, again, to carefully limit what we take from the text in terms of what we clearly see that God would have us lay hold of. And this, most importantly, would be transcendent truths and principles that bear threads that we can trace forward through the rest of Scripture. Instead of drafting notional sketches of what Earth's original geography might have looked like, and there are those out there, and I purposely didn't put one up there for us to look at and see because it's meaningless. We should home in on features that are central to the spiritual realities that we should be mining from the text. We've noted a few of these in terms of God's charge to tend and keep things in the garden in keeping with a broader principle, the dominion principle that he's charged man to. And we find vital truths that extend from the presence and directives regarding the trees of life and of the knowledge of good and evil which are clearly referred to and distinguished within the garden. And it's regarding those, I think, that are most critical to see that we're going to be headed next time as we move into chapter three. Okay, so. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, your complete provision for us as we read and Peter you provided everything for us unto life and godliness everything that you want us to lay hold of we need to look to you as to carefully rightly dividing the word of God that we would take away those things that you want us to focus on and eschew those things that we should not chase irrespective of our curiosity irrespective of our penchant to engage our imagination uh, 
unto speculation. Uh, Father, we thank you that we can stay in line, we can walk according to your provision for us in these things as we simply align with the ministry of the Spirit who will guide us not only into all truth in proper understanding personally, but also in the unity of the body coming to a corporate understanding. We can't come to this in our own devices, into our own cleverness, unto our own rationale. Though they form a part of us initially interacting with, through good in, rules of interpretation, what the text has for us, we have to f constantly rest and place those things within the realm of the ministry of the Spirit. And we thank you that we can depend on that in complete confidence and assurance. Again, thank you for our time today. Look for your blessing on the balance of it. In Jesus' name, bye.